Well, good evening. Let's stand as we sing number 244 in your hymnals if you want to use them. It is only that you look, and here we go. I'm a message from the Lord, hallelujah, the message unto you I'll give. Tis recorded in his word, hallelujah, it is only that you look and live. Look and live, my brother, live. Look to Jesus now and live. and live life is offered unto you hallelujah eternal life thy soul shall have if you'll only look to him hallelujah that's it look and live my brother live look to Jesus now and live tis Recorded in his word, hallelujah, it is only that you look and live. I will tell you how I came, hallelujah, to Jesus when he made me whole. T'was believing on his name, hallelujah, I trusted and he saved my soul. Look and live, my brother, live. Number one, good going. Appreciate it. God bless you. Thank you for coming tonight and voting with your feet. Uh, we appreciate it much, and the Lord bless you. You hope you come hungering and thirsting for righteousness, you will be filled. You will be. God will speak to you tonight. Let's have a word of prayer together. Father, we come again in the name above every name. You said, if you shall ask anything in my name, I'll do it, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. We do. We come. We ask you to help our country, you save our country off of the uh, quagmire of evil it has sunken into. Pray, my God, that you defeat Roe versus Wade. That you'd not allow any, any force of evil, the very gates of hell would not prevail against us. Pray that we'd be conscious of the lost people around us every day. All of us in this room that are born from above would be missionaries would be lights, would be the salt to hold evil back that we're supposed to be. We pray that your word would penetrate us, get through to the, the darkness into the long-term memory. Help us tonight. We cry out for the Ukraine and Burma, Haiti, countries that have lost their government. May that not be so here. In Jesus' name. Amen. Shake hands, say hi one to another. Crescendo. A crescendo. Woohoo! Oh, yeah. If you have a cell phone, girls, and it's in your purse, you don't know if it's on or off, you may want to look at it. Make sure that nobody calls you during the service. You know, people do that. They'll call you to see if your cell phone's on. I have been known to be guilty of that. Um, pray that God's will be done on this billboard, and if the Lord would overthrow or overthrow I know that's on your mind. It's a big deal. 
We got VBC coming up. That's big. The next big event for Gospels, Vacation Bible Camp. It's a bus revival, really. Chris uh, Barrows will be the head of that. And he did a great job last year, except for he killed Pastor Bill. <laughs> so this year, maybe Barrows will get killed. Maybe. You never know. Or maybe Thomas Sweat. Or maybe Jim Knott. Maybe some of them boys get killed and you leave me alone. <laughs> so uh, I thought I was going to be able to go on vacation in June. I don't, I don't know if I'm going to be able to leave. I may stay around a while. But we'll see what's happened there. But uh, if so, I'll be in vacation Bible camp. And then for sure you're not going to kill Pastor Bill, I tell, at that point in the play. Um, I think it's a beautiful thing in communion to offer unto God. He's done so much for us. To offer unto him our labor, our love. And I think track count is a good way to do that. Tra what is track count? Track count is I care about the loss enough to give him the word of God. Now, it's just one way. It's not the only way, right? I mean, you can talk to people, write them, do all kinds of other stuff. But tracks do save people. There's a book. I have a book down here that is just solid with testimonies of people getting saved, a gospel track. And so we did door-to-door -door this week, and we're going to have that count as well as uh, your gospel count, track count as you did this week. I hope you be encouraged about your tracks. And uh, continue to do it. Don't give it up. And every, it's a winner. It's one of the deals. Is, it's a win-win. You can't lose if you just keep passing out them gospel tracts. It won't hurt a thing. And it will help some folks. And so, brother, I'm asking Brother uh, Barrows to take more and more responsibility here at the gospel. If he looks tired, that's because he is. I am pouring more and more of the responsibility of the church and, his, and things upon him. He is uh, he's doing a good job. He's doing a good job. He really is. Uh, he's going to be the head of the July 4th parade also. He's going to uh, be taking communion. He's going to be giving doing communion tonight with Brother Sweat, him and Sweat together. I'm not not doing communion because I'm not right with God, but I'm, I, I believe I'm right with God. I don't know anything between me and the service, so I'm taking communion for you people that wonder about that, even after that morning's sermon. <laughs> and so I'm asking Brother Barrows and Brother Sweat to do communion with us tonight after the track count. I'll just have a couple more announcements for you, but at this time, I'd like the men who have the Bible verses, if they'd make their way up here, as I finish out one or two more announcements. Uh, Vacation Bible Camp, if you're interested in helping out with that, it's July 20th through the 22nd, three-night event, 7 o'clock to 8.30, I believe, is the time. And if you're interested in helping out with that, we need all hands on deck. There is a sign-up. June. June. Yeah, don't show up July. We won't be here. June 20th through the 22nd at 7 o'clock to about 8.30. We need your help. And if you could, if you're willing to do that, please uh, use a sign-up sheet in the foyer. would be very, very helpful uh, for us to know. Uh, and then we'll get in contact with you. We'll have a meeting a week or two before the event and tell you what your job is. And it'll be a fun time. Well, this time we'll go ahead and do our Bible verses. I'm going to start with Psalm 119, 9 through 11. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word? With my whole heart have I sought thee, O let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. I hope that didn't erase just what I'm going to say now. Uh, John 14, 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father shall will send in my name he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever i have said unto you oh 
I'm going to read, this is a, I only memorized one part because that's all that was on the card, but the, the, the whole thought is in three verses. So I'm going to read you the first one, then I'm going to say the second one, which I memorized without looking, and then I'll read the third one, okay? So Colossians 3, 9, 10, and 11. If the first part is, lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man... Which is, re, which is renewed in the image of him that created him. There it is. Where there's neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbar, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all in all. Romans 16, 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary from the doctrine of Contrary from the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. Amen. Good job, guys. Appreciate that. We just won't have to have you guys come up during announcement time because I forgot you got to study real quick before you run up here, right? <laughs> got to give you all the time you need. Track count time. We had a great day door to door yesterday, 20 folks who showed up for that. We do have one more regular door-to-door -door, uh, for this month. And then next month, we have two, the second and third Sunday of June. We have our Vacation Bible School Blitz meeting at the same time in the same place over uh, in the courtyard there. And we'd love you to be able to help us out with that as we go out in the neighborhood and uh, look for young people who'd be willing to come to that event. But 20 folks yesterday at door-to-door, -door, 233 uh, brochures were given out. 11 times a gospel was given, and three folks trusted Christ as their Savior. It was one adult and two children. And so hopefully we'll have an opportunity to follow up with them and see some fruit that remains. And so 233 from door to door. Mike Tamara, who's not here at the moment, he texted me and said he had 1,000. 25? Let's keep going down this way. Middle section. I twenty two. Twenty two. Anybody else? Since January, we passed out 41,776. Tonight and this week, we passed out 3,010 tracks. That's a great job. Keep up the good work. I did talk to, um, actually, I didn't talk to, I was snooping around on my brother in law's uh, church he works at up in Maine, and I was looking through their service and I noticed oh, track count. They were doing track count up there, and uh, he, they obviously got the idea from here, and it's wonderful to see other people doing it, and they seem to have good results with it. So at this time, I'll ask Brother Thomas uh, to come, and we're going to do communion. I'm always thankful for uh, any opportunity to help out and to serve and to minister. I'm thankful for uh, Pastor Bill uh, asking me and, of course, asking uh, Brother Thomas to minister out communion. 
and to share some thoughts with you uh, about that. We don't take it lightly by any means, and um, hopefully you've come with your heart prepared. And before we go and we take communion, we always like to have a preface of what communion is really about. And so just real quick, I, I want to just touch base with the who, what, when, where, and why. And touch bases on that. The who, who is the Lord's table for? Well, the table is for saved believers. Saved believers who are in fellowship with God. It's for the, the folks who know that Jesus Christ paid the penalty for their sin, that they've accepted that, they've repented in faith, turned to God, and have experienced forgiveness of sins and eternal life. And those folks are the ones who are to participate, people who know, who are certain. Uh, it's not, there's no saving elements that are in here. There's no saving power in the Lord's table. Some people go to church week after week. They go to mass, um, Catholics especially, and they take communion, believing that that's somehow going to give them you know, eternal life. And sadly, that's just not the case. When we look at throughout the New Testament and we see folks who are being saved, I mean, the Philippian jailer, for one, he says, uh, you know, Paul and Silas, they said, you know, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. He didn't say, hold up, yep, wait, you got to take communion first. I mean, we don't see that anywhere. And it's a misinterpretation of Scripture for people who go and take that too far. And this is a command, just like Christ has commanded all believers to be baptized. And so the communion table and the Lord's table is for a believers, and specifically believers who are in fellowship with God. Um, if you have some sin between you and the Savior that you are just rebelling about, this, this table is not for you today. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul writes to the Corinthian church, which was in a mess of trouble, and he says, let every man examine himself, whether or not to make sure that he takes of this table worthily. And so tonight you can put on your blinders. Men, you don't have to look over at your wife and examine how she's doing. Ladies, you don't have to look at your husband. Church member, you don't have to look at the person next to you across the aisle. It's all about you and examining yourself and seeing what your relationship with the Lord is. And if you have some glaring thing in your life that you know is wrong, I would abstain, abstain from this table tonight until you are able to get that settled and make amends with whoever you need to make amends with and get along with God and settle that. And so it's for saved people who are in fellowship with the Lord. What are the elements of the Lord's table? It's the bread and the fruit of the vine or the juice, and they symbolize the body of Christ and the blood of Christ. There is no... Uh, the elements, they do not turn into the actual body and the actual uh, blood of Christ, which, again, is another misinterpretation that often gets talked about. When they enter into my body, it's still just bread. When the juice enters into my body, it's still just juice. It has no, it's not transubstantiation, as the Catholics put it, but these are the elements which picture um, what Christ has done for us and how he allowed his body to be handed over to sinners, and of course they um, shed his blood on Calvary for us. When do we do the Lord's table? We do it as often as we do it. That's what Paul the Apostle wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. There's no specific instruction in Scripture how often we're to do it. Some churches do it every time they meet. Some churches like ours, we do it. We try to do it once a month. Some churches do it once a year, and the Passover was celebrated once a year, so maybe churches did it once a year. Back then, I'm not sure. We found for our church, it's worked out good doing it once a month, and it's nice when you have that uh, often examining yourself and making sure you're in fellowship with the Lord, and so that's when we do it. Where do we do it? It's an ordinance given to the church. It's not something that individual members do in their home. It's to be done. The, the command was given to the church, and so the local church is the one who administers it. Uh, by the way, if you're here from another church, uh, you're more than welcome, and you're a saved believer in fellowship with the Lord, you're more than welcome to partake of this table. And lastly, why do we do it? Do we do it simply out of tradition? No, we do it because it's a command of the Lord. He said in Matthew 28, 19 and 20, when he told his disciples to go out into the world and preach the gospel, he says, um, and do everything that I've commanded you to do, even unto the end of the world. 
And so tonight we're here because we're specifically commanded of the Lord and definitely reiterated throughout the New Testament that the church ought to be doing it. And we do it as a reminder of the great sacrifice that Jesus made for us. And it's a time that we can set apart from the busyness of life. We can come together in unity, thanking the Lord Jesus um, that we can have fellowship with him. And so tonight I'd, ask, I'd like to ask the deacons um, or um, the other men who are helping us out in administering the communion, if they'd make their way up here. I'm going to ask before we um, distribute out the bread, I'd like to ask Brother Randy Mooneyham if he would pray and thank the Lord for his broken body for us. Father, <clears throat> Father we bow for just a moment. Lord, we just thank you for this another day, another Lord's day that you've given us, and we thank you for your grace and your mercy and your love upon us. But Father, we thank you for the greatest gift of all, and that's, Lord, when you shed your precious blood, we might have eternal life. And then the greatest sacrifice that man has ever known, we thank you for that. And Lord, as we look back to the finished work of Calvary, we just pray that you'd bless this time. And Lord, we just pray for that soul that's nearest hell tonight, Father. Give the praise, honor, and glory in Christ's name. Amen. And when he had given thanks, he, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do ye in remembrance of me. In remembrance of the broken body of Jesus Christ, eat ye all of it.
Well, I was looking over some things that I could talk about, talking about the, the blood of Jesus Christ. The phrase, the shed blood of Jesus Christ, is mentioned multiple times throughout the uh, New Testament. And Jesus' death, it wasn't a quick, easy, painless death. It was slow. It was hard. He suffered. His blood that was shed, it was great. And we might think, well, why in the world would he do this? Why did he have to suffer so much? Why couldn't he just come and make it a quick, easy, painless death? Well, there's a reason why. You see, his sacrifice was exactly like what they did in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, they used to, uh, the high priest would offer a sacrifice once a year, a blood sacrifice specifically uh, for the sins of the people. Blood had to be shed. The first mention of uh, shedding of blood was in Genesis chapter 3 when an animal was, was given up so that they can have the fur for the clothing of Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve's sin, they tried to cover up their own nakedness with fig leaves and it wasn't enough. There had to be a shedding of blood because of that sin. The reason why is in Hebrews chapter 9 verse 22 it says, and without shedding of blood there is no remission. There is no forgiveness of sins without the shedding of blood of some type. The thing that was interesting about the Old Testament sacrifice is that it was given at least once a year. Uh, the priest would offer it at least once a year, and it was a temporary thing. It was a foreshadowing of things to come. It was a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ, the ultimate sacrifice that would come. He would be the final sacrifice, the final thing that would have to shed blood for our sins. And that's what this blood represents tonight, the shed blood of Jesus Christ, the final sacrifice, the blood that can offer forgiveness, and remission of sins. And that's why we have this, as a remembrance of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. So as you men to stand, I'm going to ask Brother Neil Walling if he would pray in remembrance of that blood that Jesus shed on that cross that day. Father, as we come to you at this time and think of you on the cross shedding your blood, for our sins, how unworthy we feel, how sad we feel, and yet how happy we feel that through that blood we have forgiveness of sins. And we just praise you for that, Lord. We can't begin to imagine the pain. We can't imagine, begin to imagine what it cost, but we're thankful for it. And we pray that you give us this night and this time to remember it in Jesus' name.
11.25 says, After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. In remembrance of the shed blood of Jesus Christ, drink ye all of it. At this time, we're going to have Brother Knott come up and lead us in a song. Stand with me, if you would, please. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest stand blessed for a word. trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. To the old rugged cross I will ever be true. It Think of number one. Beautiful, beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful. Appreciate the musicians. Always special this morning. I appreciated the violin, piano special. And all the people get up here and do special music. So what a good, good thing. Someday before I die, I'm going to hear Abdiel play his trumpet again. I'm not sure when. Someday. I'm, I don't give up, brother. Your mother and I had that in common. That's right. And so I want to talk to you today. By, by the way, let me, let me clarify a few, a few things from this morning. <laughs> My son does get a hold of me. Actually, it was an exaggeration, I suppose, once a year, but he does get a hold of me as much as I want him to. And so uh, I'm not dissatisfied with him. I'm happy with him. I'm happy with my boy. I'm happy with he's responsible. And he, he married the right woman, no doubt about it. She has helped him a lot. She loves Jesus, and I don't care what color her hair is, she loves Jesus. Whether she likes the water or don't like the water, it's all minor stuff. And so I just want you to know <laughs> that I'm happy with it. Been happy with it for a long time. And I'm sure they are also. They seem to love each other. Actually, they seem to like each other. I asked my wife on the way home, do you like me? She says, sometimes. <laughs> she, gave me a, she gave me a lecture on the way home. That's a part of her you don't know. You don't know. Hey, Amen. I hope, I hope it got in. I hope, you, I hope you get fat on the word of God before the famine. Evildoers 
on the rampage. Amen. Evildoers seem to have been given permission. Permission. They feel like this is their moment. <clears throat> this is their moment. If they don't do it now, they're never going to get to do it. And so they seem like they have a sense of liberty about them, that they can destroy the Constitution of the United States, that they can uh, biasly stop free speech. Man, free speech is at the very foundation of America. I mean, you stop free speech. You stop free speech, and then dictatorships follows. And so I agree with Elon Musk that free speech is the, is the foundation of any real democracy. You have to be able to be disagreed with. Just because somebody has a wild and crazy view, that's a, they should be able to say it in a free dem democratic society. And so free speech is why we're here tonight. And I'm able to preach without intimidation uh, of being accused of... Uh, I can preach the whole Bible. Up to this point in my life, I've been able to preach the whole Bible. I've been able to say exactly what it says, and tonight I'm going to do that. This is what the Bible says. I preach without fear, partially because of so many other people's sacrifice to allow this thing called free speech to be able to be done in America here. Now, that's a sharp two-edged sword. I get it. But uh, the Lord will work it out as, as we just be able to speak his word. I want to talk to you about Psalm 9416. If you want to take your book or want to look at that, or I'll just read it for you. Psalm 9416. Who will rise up for me against the evildoers? Or who will stand up for me against the workers of iniquity? God needs you tonight. I'm talking about born-again believers now. If you're not saved, don't know Christ your Savior, this is not you. You need to get saved right with God. That's primary, necessary before this. Once you're born from above and have some understanding of the Word of God, God has saved you to be in his army. We're considered soldiers of the cross. It's not just me making that up. That's Bible. And so as soldiers, you have a duty. You have a duty to your commander-in-chief. Who is our commander-in-chief? Jesus Christ. He's the one that said, go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Why? Because he paid for that gospel. He sacrificed for that gospel. And that gospel has been paid, bought and paid for by the Lord Jesus himself, who said, now that I've paid for this salvation, that you can be saved by grace through faith, Go tell everybody you see, every creature. I was talking the other day to a squirrel. A dove came by my house the other day, was sick. You know, when they get sick, they'll puff up, real puff, these are vet, puff up. They really puff up. They must have a fever or something, I don't know. But this little dove was sick at my house. And uh, the rest of the doves were coming and going. This little dove didn't want to fly. And the little dove uh, ate, a few, ate his last meal, ate it for some corn, and then came over to my house, felt safe to come over to my house, walked over to the house there and kind of got down in the evening when it began to get dark. And I went over there and said, it won't be long. It won't be long, little dove. You're going to have liberty. You're going to get liberty. Did you know the creatures were brought under bondage because of our sin? And you remember Romans 8, right? The glorious liberty of the children or sons of God. They're groaning at this moment in pain. The creation groaning together in pain, waiting for the redemption of you and me. The final call. That little dove looked at me. That little black eyes of theirs, and they looked at me, and she blinked her eyes, and I thought, yeah, you, you know. You have to go back to the one who made you. But pretty soon, everybody gets liberty under Christ. We have a purpose. We have a mission. There's no insignificant believer. Every believer will meet somebody that nobody else will meet, and you have an influence over somebody that nobody else will have an influence like you have. 
You're, you're unique. You're special. You're, you're fit for the job. When God said go in the world and preach the gospel, he knew what he was talking about. I'm going to take up with that little phrase there, who will rise up for me? And I ask you tonight, who will rise up for Jesus, for the word of God? Who will rise up against abortion? Who has slain over 60 million little babies in America? I can't even imagine the number. I can't get my mind around it. The only thing I'm surprised about that number is that we're still here. 60 million people over a period of all that's 1973 to today, how many children would they have had? These We're talking about the people that were aborted. They would have already been grown up and had children. You're probably talking about 120 million people have been wiped off the face of the earth. Just in America, not in Canada, not in South America, not in Europe. This world is getting ripe for judgment. And God says, who will rise up for me against the evildoers? Those are the abortion folks. And we've tried here at the gospel to do our best at rising up against the abortion by billboards. Right now I have one, 30,000 bucks a year up there, 2.3 million views. And we, we rise up against it personally, one-to-one. We rise up against it as a church. We did picketing along the road for years, picketing along the road. Who will rise up for me against crime? Crime, whoever thought a defunded police was a moron? Amen? I mean, come on, defund the police. What what do you want, chaos? Yes, they want chaos. What are they getting? Chaos. Cities are going crazy. There's so much talk of racism, so much talk of whites over blacks and blacks over whites. New York, a young white guy shot... Ten killed ten people recently. Just that was in Buffalo. Hatred. They're building on purpose. They're building this hatred when it's really non-existent. Your 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 big your black leaders say, "Quit talking about it, and it'll go away." But they won't. They keep talking about it. who will rise up for me against crime. Who will rise up for me against juvenile delinquency, which is bankrupting. America's large cities. San Carlos Park, where I used to live, is one of the leading areas for car theft. Why? Due to juveniles. Who will rise up for me against the evil of divorce? Six out of ten marriages failing. You want to know why young people are afraid to get married? Because they've seen so many failures. They've seen failures among grandpa and grandpa. Grandma and grandpa, they've seen failures among mom and dad. They've seen failures on aunts and uncles. And pretty soon they're like, man, I mean, the chances are better that I'm going to get divorced than than, than I'm not going to get divorced. Six out of ten, 60%. Who will rise up for me and stay married the entire life? Good Ugly, bad, whatever. You're just going to stay married, brother. I tell, I tell my wife, I'd never divorce you. I'm just going to torture you to death. I don't mean that. Now, don't, don't go home and take that. But you know what I'm saying? I'm going to stay married to that old girl. I mean that girl. Who will rise up for me? Who will rise up for me against the horror that's going on in the average home of America? Homes are literally exploding like bloated three-day dead carcasses full of vile, putrid hate and anger. Teenagers typically hating their parents' authority and ruling, rules and cuss words among them is terrible. I saw a medical doctor get on YouTube and say she hated her mom and dad. Who will rise up for me against covetousness? It seems like the dollar is king. Making money is the goal of every, almost everybody's life. Being rich. When the Bible says, don't seek to be rich. You get rich, then it's, 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 it's a side benefit. It's not your goal. My goal is to please God. If your goal is to please God and he makes you rich, okay, use it for his glory. But don't seek as your God, as your goal in life to be rich. 
That puts something before God. Who will rise up for me against covetousness? By the way, one of the most mentioned sins of the Bible. Parents in record numbers are selling their souls, their home life, their children, to have large, spacious homes decorated to the T with two or three cars, computers, appliances, video games, and almost nothing being withheld from them. And yet their families are falling apart. Some of the most miserable families I've ever seen are rich people's families, oftentimes torn up with covetousness. Who will rise up for me against the homosexual movement? Culturally and socially, our boys are becoming more and more like girls, and our girls are becoming more and more like boys. Boys are wearing earrings while women are getting tattoos. Boys are growing long hair while girls are getting their hair cut short. Boys are acting effeminate while girls are walking, talking, and cussing like men. Boys are being told they are not necessarily the leaders while girls are being told they are the leader. Boys are taking, are walking like girls and girls are sitting and walking like boys. Who will rise up for me against the transgender movement and the homosexuality movement? Will you? Who will rise up against ecclesiastical wickedness? In my 1900 years, Scripture has taught that men are the only ones that can be deacons and pastors in the local church, yet we have people today reinventing the Bible and saying it's okay if women be are preachers now and it's okay if women are deacons. Let me tell you, the Bible doesn't change. God doesn't change. It wasn't right for Paul and the apostles. It's not right for us. Amen. Who will stand up for that? Who will stand up for truth? They're bringing in rock and roll music, which was uniformly condemned as the devil's music in the 50s and 60s. And now has become the normal church music. I'm not talking about words now. Who will rise up for me, God says, against the workers of evil? Who will rise up for modesty? Why skin, skin, skin. One of the reasons I don't want to do any more weddings is I get tired of the controversy. I get tired of fighting. For modesty, I get weary and trying to tell the bride, "Look, you, I don't. This ain't the time to be dressing in shrink wrap." Well, I want I want my husband to like me. You got plenty of time for that, but at the wedding, you're representative of Christ in the church, and you want to be dressed and you want to have clothes on and you want your body covered. I never have trouble with the grooms, by the way, Gillespie. They're always dressed. I see the men, they're like me tonight. They got clothes down to the wrist here. They got clothes right up to here. Grooms, you know, the best man and all these men that stand over on this side. And they're all clothed and they're all nice. They got, they're, they're not overly tight pants or overly tight dresses. And they, they, <laughs> they got shoes on. You don't see their, what has happened to us? Over on this side where the women gather, nakedness, straight up and down, nakedness. Women showing their bosoms and and too low, too tight, too high. I'm like, what are you trying to prove? Backless, sideless. Well, you get backless dresses at the typical wedding all the way down to there, all the way down to the tramp stamp. Oh, yeah. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of it. It's time Christians act like Christians. Quit trying to model the world. Let's not act like they act. Let's not sing the songs they sing. Let's not go to the places they go. Let's not drink what they drink. Let's not talk like they talk. And let's not wear what they wear. You say, brother, I ain't going to ask you to marry me. Well, amen. (laughs) Who will rise up for me against the work of against the evildoers, the Bible says? Who will who will stand up for me against the workers of iniquity? What happened to Israel? Well, let me take you to the Bible on this. Ezekiel chapter 22. You thought this was just going to be all exhortation. No, no, this is Bible study. Now we're in Bible study. 
Ezekiel 22, 26, all the way through 31. Let me read that to you. This is the children of Israel. This is the complaint God had against them. He said, her priests have violated my law and have profaned my holy things. They have put no difference between the holy and the profane. They have, neither have they showed difference between the unclean and the clean. They have hid their eyes from my Sabbath, and I am profaned among them. Her princes in the midst thereof are like wolves ravening the prey, that's that covetousness, to shed blood and destroy souls and to get dishonest gain, that's covetousness. And her prophets have daubed uh, the whole thing with untempered mortar. Basically, they've covered up the sin as much as possible. I have in my, I have in my notes here, prosperity gospel, that's what that is. And they just speak positive. They don't want to say anything about sin or anything negative in their services because people won't come to hear it. And it says, And they divining lies unto them, saying, Thus saith the Lord, when the Lord hath not spoken. The people of the land have used oppression and exercised robbery and have vexed the poor and the needy. Yea, they have oppressed the strange stranger wrongfully. I have sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in a gap before me for the land. Why? That I should not destroy it. But I found none. Therefore I have poured out mine indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Their own way have I recompensed upon their heads, saith the Lord God. In Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 49, it lists what the sins of Sodom were. People are real quick to say, oh, Sodom and Gomorrah. Oh, that must have been an awful place. God destroyed it by fire. He did it, by the way, according to Peter, as an example for everybody that would want to live ungodly afterwards. He, He destroyed that city and those people to show his feelings about what they were doing. But what was, you may say, well, the sin of Sodom was homosexuality. Obviously, it was. But that's not what Ezekiel says in 1649. He says, Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom, pride. You do not want to have these. Are you with me tonight? You do not want to be considered proud. God forbid that people would consider you proud. Self-promoting. Pride was number one mentioned. Fullness of bread. They had everything they wanted to eat. Does this sound familiar? Abundance of idleness. They got a lot of free time. Now, whoa, this is almost like news right off the headlines of the paper today. And it mentions, interestingly, at the end, it says, um, neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. They really don't care about the poor and needy. The, the Democratic Party wants to use the poor people, Amen. not help them. Amen. And I'm not saying that politically. I am saying that by observation. The Democrats have have pretty well owned the inner cities for 50 years. How are they doing? The inner cities are destroying themselves. The black population at one time was 19%. Now it's 12%. The black population is going down. They're killing each other. Where's most of the abortions happen? Among the poorest of our nation. That crime of abortion is being propagated upon the poor people. How many geniuses have been aborted? How many people that could have helped us economically have been aborted? I heard a businessman say one of the biggest threats to America is depopulation. It doesn't do you any good to have a business if there's nothing, nobody to buy what you got. You got to have people. Yeah, that's what it said. Isaiah Take your Bibles, this is a profound chapter, by the way. Isaiah chapter 3, verse 4 through 12. This is the Bible study part. This is the judgment that God said in Isaiah 3 upon his people, about the children of Israel, as was Ezekiel. 
He says in verse 4, I will give children to be their princes, and babes shall rule over them. The President of the United States right now can't even put a sentence together. I've seen children can speak better than him. And I think, God, you did that to us. You did that to us. You gave us this guy. He's fulfilling it. I'll give you children to be your princes and babes shall rule over them. College students are influenced in politics by demonstrating and by intimidation. If you want to speak the truth, go to, go to college and start talking this kind of stuff right here and see what happens. They'll threaten your life. They'll intimidate you. They'll burn you out. He says, the people and the people shall be oppressed Every one by another. I just said it. Everybody oppresses everybody. Everybody against everybody. Total division. And every one by his neighbor. That means a neighbor against neighbor. The child shall behave himself proudly against the ancient. And the base against the honorable. We're seeing it. It's like headlines right off of it. And the show of their countenance doth witness against them that they declare their sin as Sodom, they hide it not. Woe unto their soul, for they have rewarded evil unto themselves. Say ye to the righteous, and I like verse 10, say ye to the righteous that it shall be well with him, for they shall eat the fruit of their doings. Woe unto the wicked, it shall be ill with him, for the reward of his hand shall be, he be, be, given, be given him. As for my people, children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. That is the Bible. That's not Bill Lytel, a uh, uh, chauvinist pig bill. A curse upon Israel from God was that women would be in positions of rulership. Oh, that would go well today. That's how far we've come, away from the Bible. Who will rise up for me? Against the workers of iniquity, this preacher is. I'm not going to condone uh, feminism in any shape or form because it's not Bible, and instead of helping women, it hurts them. As for my people, children of their oppressors, women shall rule over them. Oh, my people, that which lead thee, it cause thee to err. Their leadership causes them to err. Destroy the way of thy paths. Who will rise up for me against the evildoers? Who will, who will stand up for me against the workers of iniquity? Who will make up the hedge? Who will stand in the gap before me in the land that I should not destroy it? but I found none. Let me review a little bit. Who shall rise up for me against immodesty? Who shall rise up for me against immorality? Who shall rise up for me against sensuality? Who shall rise up for me against unisex movement, homosexuals? Who shall rise up for me against compromising and changing the Bible? Who shall rise up for me against women's clothing on men and men's clothing on women? Who shall rise up for me against sensual dress of girls? Who shall rise up for me against rock and roll music sucking the spiritual life out of our nation? Who shall rise up for me against anti-God wolves and sheep's clothing coming into youth groups and preying on the young girls? Who shall rise up for me against divorce? Who shall rise up for me against abortion? Who shall rise up for me in public schools destroying our young people with the lies of progressivism? Well, there's one guy right there. And there's another right there. You've been raised up by God to hold the banner, brother. If it costs you your job, so be it. Tell them the truth. Who shall rise up for me against the flood of iniquity and sensuality and no standards? that is threatening to reduce us as a nation, honestly, to rubble. I am, I'm willing. I've been standing up against these things in prayer, in practice, in words, in voting, in letter writing, 
in volunteering, in door-to-door, in evening visitation, in exhortation, in my finances, in my energy, in God's power. I am. Will you? Will you? Will you seriously consider? You may have already been doing this. Seriously consider continually doing it until you until the end that God takes you home. And if you haven't been, don't you let the left, whether in Christianity or politically, don't you let the left move you. Don't you let them move you. Stick with the things of God and the things of Bible. Why? God needs you. Tonight, our passage said God needs you. Why would he ask who will rise up for me against the evildoers if he didn't need you? He needs you. You say, me? What do I make? What difference do I make? You make a difference. Have you ever seen fire ants? An amazing thing about fire ants. I often, when I pray, I say, God, I prayed this just the other night. I say, God, I'm just like one of them little fire ants. Think about it. Seven billion people. I'm just like a little fire ant. I'm smaller than that. And God says to that little fire ant, pick up, pick up a grain of sand and you put it where I tell you to put it. And that fire ant takes that little grain of sand. When you wipe that mound out, he, they all come out. What do they come out for? To rebuild the mound. And they, all of them got their duty. They go pick that little grain of sand up and they put it back where they're supposed to. Just one fire ant. I'm just one little fire ant. I take the grain of sand that God has given me, the influence that God has given me, It may not be much, and it may not go out very wide, but I take whatever God has given me, and I don't diminish it, and I don't despise it. I just know that's God's will for me, and I take that little piece of sand, and I put it where God wants me to put it. And if all my brothers and sisters in the fire ant mound are do the same thing, the next morning the fire ant mound is completely rebuilt, miraculously. I did this for chapel for our kids one time. Went out one to the fire ant mounds, and I took my foot, wiped it out, of course, you know, 30, 40,000 fire ants come out. I mean, maybe more. And I told the boys, better back up. And so those fire ants came out of that thing. I said, now what are they going to do? They're going to do their job. Every one of them is going to do their job. That's all you got to do is do what God has put before you to do. Whatever God's put before you to do, you know what to do. Do what you're supposed to do. Don't worry about what everybody around you is doing whether you get as much glory as they do or much attention as they do, much recognition as they get or anything, don't you worry about all that. Just do what God's asked you to do. And the next morning, I took all that same class of kids out there and that fire ant mound was completely rebuilt. Now we're talking thousands of pieces of sand, thousands and thousands of pieces of sand were put back. And actually it looked a little bit better than it was before. I said, look at that. I said, that's your life. That fire ant has one little short life, but he uses it for God to do what he's supposed to do. The Bible says, observe the ant. Observe the ant. The Bible commands us to observe the ant. And you're going to learn, quit looking around at what everybody else is doing and do what you're supposed to do, when you're supposed to do it, how you're supposed to do it, with the gifts that you've been given to do it, and be happy that God has allowed you to be used for his kingdom. And then when you die, you have accomplished your purpose. And you can go on to heaven. Amen. Who will rise up for me? Father, help us tonight. A very simplistic message from the word, but as Bible as John 3.16. Pray, God, that you'd help us to have a burden to do the right thing, to stand up against the propaganda, to stand up against the progressivism, to stand up against the communism, stand up against the the socialism, to stand up against those things which would shut churches down everywhere, stop the word of God, make it illegal to pass tracts out, make it illegal to be a public witness. God in heaven, you've given us this open door. You really have. It's been paid for. Ooh, it's been paid for by the blood of the soldiers of people who have gone before us. Help us not to take it lightly. Please don't take it from us. Please remember us. Help us and get a new vision of the responsibility we have for our society and the people around us. Spare us, Father, as one spares his only son. In Jesus' name.
Amen. Let's stand up together. Let's stand up together by the grace of God. I hope you're determined to do God's will in your life. I hope you're determined to find out what it is and do it. He'll show you. But I, you know, you young people may not know God's final will for you. No, of course you don't. But you know enough about the will of God to do and keep yourself busy right now, don't you? He wants you to read the Bible, right? He wants you to come to church, right? He wants you to witness for him, right? He wants you to help missions, right? you got enough stuff to do without knowing any more than that. Just do what's before you to do by the grace of God, and then he'll give you more complicated things to do when you do what he wants you to do. Does that make sense? He will. Trust him for it. Maybe there's some things in your life that you need to get right on. Maybe, there's some, maybe, there's, maybe you just need God's power for, and, and courage. Some of you are going to college, Hubler. Going to, man, I'm telling you, there's a bunch of wickedness down there at Gulf Coast University. Stand up for God, brother. Be a light. I saw you on TV the other day. Saw you on TV the other day. You never mentioned Gospel Baptist. I was kind of hoping, saying, by the way, I go to Gospel Baptist Church just down the road there. Now, remember, if they ever interviewed, to put that in there, would you? I looked down the TV and I said, that's Brother Hubler. You never know when the opportunity is going to come by. Amen? You come do business with God. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lord. as I am thou wilt receive wilt welcome pardon cleanse relieve because thy promise I believe O Lamb of God I come Let's close in a word of prayer. Lord, we're thankful for the preaching of your word. Uh, thank you for the message you put on the heart of Pastor Bill tonight. And it seems like every day things seem to be getting drastically and drastically worse in our country and in the world. It's not really a slow slide anymore. It seems like it's a drastic slide. And we're heartbroken about uh, the world and our country. But what an opportunity we have to rise up and to stand up for what's right. Uh, we think about the great heroes of the faith that have gone before us and uh, how you gave grace to Moses and Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, the apostles, and many more. And may you give us the same grace to stand up for what's right. Throughout this auditorium, I'm sure there's folks just as I did who may not come down to the altar, but in their heart they said, you know, I'm going to do what's right. I'm going to rise up. I'm going to stand up for the truth. May you give us the power to do so. In Jesus' name, amen.